They just do it manually. Yeah. All right. Hello, everybody. Did you have a good lunch? Did everyone have a nice lunch? Hey, John. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. Wasn't that salad amazing? That was just so good. I'm so Yeah, everyone, good. Um, uh, hopefully our virtual participants got to get some virtual salad. <laughs> Um, so I want to get us started for the afternoon uh, with our first presentation of the afternoon. If you uh, could uh, find your seats, please, um, and tweet your friends to come back to the room so they know we're starting. Um, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Marie Sini, who is currently the president of the Council for Adult and Experiential Learning. And um, I'm just going to turn it over to Marie to get us started. Thank you, Marie, for being here. Sure. Thank all of you for your attention. Can you guys hear me with the uh, lavalier mic? Everybody can hear? Good. Because I tend not to want to stay in one place. I'm always moving. And I uh, was saying to Carrie that from, the, from my teaching past, I always, you know, except when I started teaching online, then I couldn't move around as much. But... I taught for a long time face-to-face, -face and I know the tricks, right? So if you're not paying attention, I can walk up, and those of you who teach know this. So I might be wandering a little bit, uh, but I will try to stay uh, focused at the front. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here today. I really appreciate this, and it feels like I'm back with my tribe, because I have spent most of my career in uh, adult post-secondary education and very much in online adult education. In fact, I started teaching in 1996 primarily because I was working with adult learners. Um, and, I, and I just want to kind of give a bit of an overview of what key messages I want to give today. Um, one of those is we're living in a, oh, by the way, did I fool anybody? Do you all know what VUCA is? In my description, I talked about a VUCA world. Oh, good. I, I put that on there on purpose, and I didn't explain it. And Alex said, what's a VUCA world? And I said, Th exactly. I want you to be asking. Um, I have a slide. I'll explain it. But uh, basically, we're living in a world that is feeling a little bit um, out of control. And things are ambiguous. We don't always have the answers. Things are happening rapidly. And we're being asked to innovate even in a time when uh, things seem, the change is occurring, but we have to innovate even more quickly. But I would argue that all of you in here who work in online education, you're like the key people that we should be talking to. I know I'm talking to the converted. You're all, you know, like cheerleaders for online. Um, but use that as a strength. Realize that is the strength, one of the strengths that you have. You've been through the revolution. Um, some of us have the scars to prove it, right? Um, how many people here, just so I know, how many people here are general faculty types teaching online? Okay. When I say types, you could be part-time, full-time, you know. How about some uh, administrators sort of running programs? All right. Who's everybody else? <laughs> Did you just cover the free lunch? <laughs> I just want to know who I'm talking to. Do we have higher level administrators? Students? Instructional designers. I forgot a key member of that tribe. And who else? Help desk. Help desk. Student support people. Okay. This is really important because it takes a village. It takes a group of people to do education well. And this is going to be one of my points to you. So um, unfortunately, I have to go back here to advance. Um, I'm not sure anything is advancing. Could you? <laughs> we might be stuck. I think it's like this. Right. Here we go. All right. Can we go back one? So, yeah. What do I hit? Is that right? So forward and back. Got it. All right. And it takes a okay. Thank you. So uh, one of my underlying premises here is that online education changed how instructors teach and how learners approach learning. Um, and many of you probably realize this when you were, if you were to, how many people here have taught in some way, shape, or form face-to-face? -face? Like, in a fa there you go. I don't care if it was training. Right. 
And you've taught online too, to some extent, right? Or learned online, right? So we all learned that there were different ways that people learned as we were teaching and we had to teach differently online. And it's amazing how much those things actually influenced much of what we do face to face. Whether or not you realize it, it was um, very likely that that was happening. And um, and so I want I want to bring this now to here you are at SUNY Online, very powerful organization, doing a lot of good. You're doing a lot of work. You've learned much more about my 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 guess is. In fact, I, I know this to be true. You all, because you teach online or help design online programs or coach online or have taken programs online, you probably know more about effective teaching and instruction than a whole lot of people in the system who perhaps never had to actually think through what it means to really learn and to really teach. And that's what online education did for many of us. You know, I did a pretty traditional PhD I had you know, the typical advisors saying to me, you do not want to be out there teaching. Don't hang out with those undergrads. I mean, literally, right? You want to buy yourself out of teaching. You always want to have enough research funds so that you can focus on research. And you know, that was sort of the message that you got if you were in any kind of a research PhD. And so when I graduated, I had taught, but I didn't really know what I was doing. And so my very first job post graduate uh, or post PhD I was teaching adults and I had a whole lot to learn I'm very appreciative of the fact that I was at uh, a pretty traditional institution but that had a very innovative sort of teaching center and a very innovative um, unit that focused entirely on adult learners it was before the internet though and it makes me feel really old so it's like back in the days of the printing press or something but we did everything on Saturdays. I mean, that was the big innovation. We ran a four-year program in four years for adults, taking accelerated classes, two at a time. We drove them through the entire year, practically. They only had a very few Saturdays off. Um, and it was wildly successful, and it was very innovative, and it was a whole lot of fun. But I had to teach differently, and I had to learn to teach differently. Um, and so I did, but it wasn't until online came to be and we started putting programs online that it really forced us to step back and sort of lay out and design. Those of you who are designers, like this is what you do, but remember a whole lot of faculty do not know that you have to do this. You start with what the outcome should be and you design backwards and you link activities to the learning outcomes. Things that you probably all had in your master's degree and what you learned that typical PhD research faculty don't get that instruction. Because again, we're supposed to all go out and do research, but you know, those pure research jobs are really hard to come by. So online, and I could tell as I was learning to do things online, I was learning a whole new conceptual model of how people learn and how I had to create the learning experience very thoughtfully. And then I started thinking, but wait, it's not just for online. Shouldn't we be doing this face to face? Of course we should, but we don't. And so when I became a dean and then provost at University of Maryland University College, now global campus, um, we had training and design and quality assurance for the online classes. Did we do any of that for face to face? What do you think? No. Because face-to-face, uh, -face, everybody knows what they're doing. And well, I was that dean who started to visit the classes and I would come back and just, I was so devastated. I mean, faculty were doing the you know death by PowerPoint of just like li lines and lines of text and they were lecturing and there was no engagement. And so I had to help even our folks at this like large public institution um, that we were in. Uh, understand that face-to-face -face also had to be designed and we had to teach faculty how to actually engage and activate those learners. So if you think about the early fears, and I'm bringing this up on purpose because there's a lot of fear out there now and I'm going to talk a little bit more about fear in a minute and share some of my own fears actually. 
So you remember the early fears of um, online education? So I remember giving presentations in the late 90s on Siberia. We called it Siberia. People were afraid about learning out there in the, in the Siberian world. And we would get lost out there. And people would feel like there wasn't any kind of connection to the human beings. And it was just going to be poor quality. And I mean, I've been through it all with, with our faculty at at uh, the, where I was at that time, and I was on the faculty, but I was one of those faculty that was trying to influence and get other faculty to do this. And people thought there would be rampant cheating, and they never asked, is there already maybe rampant cheating face-to-face? -face? Of course not. Oh my gosh, there's none there, but it's all going to be online. And so, um, thank you. Thank you, sir. That was great. Give that man a round of applause. I don't have to keep wandering back here. As long as it works. All right. So um, so we had these worries, right? And what we learned, because I, I was asked to talk, you know, hit on a couple of key points that I think you're all pondering. And one, one has to do with scale, because I know you're trying to think through scale. And what I want to tell you is, University of Maryland Global Campus, and by the way, now that I'm not there anymore, like, go SUNY online. Okay? <laughs> I want you to eat their lunch, eat their lunch. See, I have your, I have your mug. Now I love you guys best, because they haven't asked me back to talk any time. Uh, no, but seriously, we, we were terribly afraid of you, um, because we thought, oh my gosh, if SUNY Online really gets going, they're, they're just going to eat our lunch. They have all these campuses, and New York's bigger, and you know, you've got more, more powerful people up there. So you guys could pick off a whole lot of places. I'll give you the inside secrets on what to do with UMGC. Um, but what we did, and we, we are, were are a state institution, is we started with the learner in mind. Okay? UMGC is separately accredited. It's got its own president, its own provost. It has full-time faculty. It also has a lot of part-time faculty. Um, but everything from its inception was wrapped around the adult learner. And so we learned to scale very early because students were just, uh, UMGC went online pretty early in the online world, and they just kept getting enrollments. And so if you just keep getting enrollments, you almost, you will fail if you don't start to standardize some things, because you're gonna, you'll be crushed by the weight of all these different things that are occurring, right? So we had um, unbundled faculty roles. Our program directors were really the designers we had uh, of the curriculum and, the, and most of the courses. We had instructional designers that were on the team for every course. We had part-time faculty that, that went through rigorous training in their part of the teaching modality. They didn't have to come in and design the course and pick the textbook. And then we went to all OER, yay, and I know you guys are too, so cool. Maryland and New York are gonna lead the way. Um, and so, uh, in order to actually serve a lot of students, you have to think differently. And it's hard. Look, I was a traditional faculty member. I picked the textbook, I put my syllabus together, uh, I got to talk about what I wanted to talk about in class. If I didn't want to talk about the brain and intro psychology because I thought it was boring, I'd be like, yeah, you guys don't need that. I mean, these things happen, right? All this, we call it academic freedom, even though it's not quite that, the definition. But I need, when I have 50,000, 60,000, 70,000 students, I need to know that everybody has learned about the brain because they're gonna take later courses in social science and if they don't know about the brain or they don't know about research or whatever, they're gonna be in trouble. So by putting the students at the center, you always are gonna default, if you grow, to some level of standardization. And there was a time, I will tell you, at at UMGC that we couldn't use the word standardization, even though we had already kind of standardized. But the faculty, and I always think of myself as a faculty member first, I get it. I wish things hadn't changed. It used to be a, a lot more fun to teach. You just, you did your best, you had fun, but nobody worried about outcomes, et cetera. But you, you have to standardize. Um, and so, you know, it was an ongoing battle. I'm not saying that, you know, it's easy. But over time, I think people start to see the reality of it. 
of why that's important. Faculty have to be part of the design. They have to be part of the experience. They have to be the subject matter experts. We have to do a better job in this country of helping faculty understand their great, huge value. But guess what? We never learned how to be curriculum developers. We never learned how to be designers. So quit, quit making me do that. Give me somebody to help me. So that's really what we have to be thinking about. Um, also at UMUC, we went to eight-week accelerated courses for all adult learners. Um, I, <laughs> I was not gray before that period of time. I became totally gray after that. Uh, it, people weren't happy. Faculty weren't happy. Deans weren't happy. Uh, it turns out that when you go to eight-week courses, adult learners have more control, and it's a shorter period of time. They still do the work. Grades actually, uh, the number of A's increased. Um, the number of uh, failures decreased. Most B's and C's stayed the same. Uh, and we had a 5% increase in course completion. And we didn't dumb down the course, believe me. So all kinds of good things can happen uh, when you're talking about this. But I also want to remind you of the bad old days. Remember the bad old days? Do anybody remember the bad old days? And this would be like, this would be good course design. Seriously, these are funny. And I, I remember a colleague of mine was doing our online writing center. And every page she developed looked like this. It was like 10 different colors and four different fonts and little animations. And we thought that was good design. It's really not good design. Um, and so, of course, you know, my course lacks interactivity and it has no point. I assumed the software would take care of that. These were, this was what a lot of faculty, when we first started working with other faculty at my institution back then, thought. They were just like, well, it's magic, right? How do you put this, how do you load the stuff in there? And we ended up doing some very early course design. Um, it's not magic, and you have to learn what it takes. Uh, and also, this is another favorite one that I found. Remember, we'd have a course information page in Blackboard, and there'd be no information has been provided. Can you imagine being a student and you, this happened more often than not. Um, maybe sometimes still does. This is not good for the student. Anyway, what we have done together, and this is what's really important, my maybe first major point, is that you guys know all you need to know about innovating for the future. Because together, online educators have really created a field and a discipline. When I started teaching in 1996, there were no guides. There was no research. There was nothing. We looked. We had to make it up. Uh, and it was a little frightening because we didn't know what we were doing. We're like, how do we know we won't hurt the students? I mean, you care about your students, right? So we started teaching online. And then we started to see some articles coming out. And we started to see some research. And OLC was doing good work. And today, nobody really questions, is there a field? Are there people who are focused on online education and experts? Of course there are. Um, and we research it. In 2009, there was a Department of Education meta-analysis that shows that it's all about the design, not the modality. Hybrid is the best form of learning. Um, online is second best. And coming in third is fully face-to-face. -face. But I still have people say to me all the time, like really quietly, like they, they're almost embarrassed, like, but is online as good as face-to-face? -face? Right, they want to whisper the question. Like, all right, and then I pull out the meta-analysis. So we have to think about that when we think about going into the future. Um, and we need to extract what we learned. So you might not realize this during the online revolution. It cracks me up when people call it the online revolution. It took 25 years for us to get where we are. It was hardly a revolution. It was an evolution, inching up, inching up, inching up. But you learned more about teaching. You learn that it takes a tribe of people to create a good course, not just one person. Um, we learn that students have to be actively involved in that course, and that even online, online, you can often have them be far more interactive. Right now, I don't know any of you individually. I'm just talking at you. If we were online, you guys know this, we'd be interacting. I'd be writing to you, asking how you're doing, can I help you with anything? You'd be posting discussions. Um, it's a whole different world. And again, you're the converted, you understand that. There are still people who don't get that. So what was it that we can learn from our experience with online learning? And I think it's really important to know what we can learn so that we can apply it to what's going on in our VUCA world. 
Um, there was a technology in a future state that presented itself before we knew what to do with it. So we had the internet. And I remember my dean, he was this, one of those deans that he always had to have the latest computer and he was always dinking around and doing stuff and coming out to show the faculty. And so one day he was like, here, go to this new thing called a search engine. This is how old I am. And he's like, type in a uh, lemon pie. And it, there was a web crawler that went out and brought in all the recipes in the world for lemon pie, which I had actually never heard of. And he thought this was really cool. So we, it was kind of a fun time, but we didn't know what to do with this thing. And so we started, you know, thinking through what possibly could we do. And this is when we came up with, maybe we should put course materials on this cool thing and students could access them outside of class. And then we got this cool idea, well, maybe they could actually take the class. This was mind-blowing. You guys who are younger don't quite get how it blew our minds. This was taking, when I say that we took education out of the classroom, we really did. Um, uh, I have to say that today, that institution has a very few students going to school still in their 40, in their um, face-to-face format on Saturdays. There's always a few. Huge, huge numbers of online students. So in a way, I feel really good about the fact that we started that, you know, that whole thing. Um, but it was a very different day. As we taught online, we created the discipline and we learned as we went along and it became a valid research endeavor. And so today, you can actually get tenure by doing research on online learning and how, how students learn online and the best ways to approach online. And it really did help to broaden our knowledge about teaching and what is good teaching so that we can apply that back to the traditional classroom. And you should embrace that and you should know that and you should own it. And on those days when you feel bad and you're being beaten up and people tell you this is not, they don't like it, this online learning stuff, you, it, it really was a slow revolution that really changed how we think about education. Um, and so now let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, now I'm going to fly by the next one because uh, I have an instructional designer who unfortunately likes to riff. And so I told her what to put in the slides. And every once in a while, as I was looking at him this morning, I was like, why did she put that one in there? So you, you have to laugh at this because this is what she was thinking. She's like, goodbye, higher education classroom. And I was like, Layla, no. <laughs> I could have pulled it out, but we were having technical. We're not saying goodbye to the higher education classroom. In fact, I would say we are thinking through a much richer version of the higher education class experience. And it's going to be a combination of digital and face-to-face. -face. We are not saying goodbye to it. And we've already said hello to online learning, so ignore those. Um, and I you know, just need to get back to her and tell her to quit riffing. Um, so one of the things, and I hope I have this slide, but I'm afraid maybe, let me see if I can get to it, if it's in here. I might have missed a slide. I want to, I want to give you some data. So one of the things when I'm doing a presentation these days, it used to be that you could put a presentation together and I wanted to talk a little bit about um, online or on New York uh, numbers. But the world's changing so quickly that I've learned that I always have to be ready at the last minute to like add something. And so I think it was just yesterday, NC Sarah released all the data about how many schools in New York actually offer online, how many enrollments they were, and then how many from outside. And so while, uh, and I had this cool slide, but just trust me. So what I'm saying is SUNY online is strong. You absolutely are, and you're gonna get stronger, but you have competition. So I just went in and I picked a few. These are schools from other states that have online enrollments in New York. And the question I would ask, which I used to ask when I was at UMGC, why them and not us? Like, why are they going there instead of, you know, your cool programs? Bellevue University in Nebraska has 252 of your students. Arizona State in Arizona has 623. They're clear across the country. Drexel has 201. Purdue Global has 1,257. SNU, anybody want to guess SNU? Somewhere in the middle, 4,928. Yeah, they're, they're the big, they're the sneaky ones that really take a lot. 
UMGC, I was ready to come in here and be like, ah, oh, look at it, it was only 557. But you guys should get that back. I'm telling you, I mean, I don't, no loyalty there. And Western Governors, 2,292. And then there are a whole bunch of other little schools that have twos and threes and fives and sixes. And, um, and somebody is always going to say, well, what about University of Phoenix, aren't they? The for-profits have gone down big time. But University of Phoenix still has 3,104, and Capella still has 1,861. 1, you start adding all of that up, and you're losing a lot of students. And now we know, and NC Sarah talks about this, stu students really want to take their online programs at a school within a 50-mile radius. They want the New York system to provide these, or the SUNY system. And so, you know, use that. The reason that they're going elsewhere, marketing. Other places spend a lot more in marketing. I'm not saying you should spend more in marketing, but you're going to have to counter that somehow. Um, formats like Western Governors that's competency-based, and they're, they're accredited, though. So, you know, competency is the new online. Is it, good in, is, is it, is it as good as face-to-face? -face? Is it as good as online? Well, we're going to have to start answering that because you have huge competitors out there. Um, so let's talk about what the, the future is that you guys are going to be dealing with. And if you've seen this data, bear with me. And if you haven't, I want you to take it back. Either way, I want you to take it back to your colleagues, your administrators, your bosses, your friends. You have to get people to understand we are on the precipice of some major, major demographic changes that you're going to have to embrace and, and figure out. Um, I, <laughs> I'm not kidding you. When I'm asked to give a talk, people always, you didn't, Alex, so I appreciate it, but I can't tell you how many people have said, we want you to be provocative, <laughs> right? And they use that word, literally. And, and in, she didn't, but in a way, you know, there's a little bit of it. But she said, you were already the converted, so I didn't have to provoke you. But you guys need to go back and provoke everybody else because guess what? This is happening. This is coming. Um, in New York State, sorry, total fall enrollment in degree-granting post-secondary institutions um, has now kind of leveled off. So it's 2000, grew up through 2010, around 2017, which was the last time there was data in this particular report. It's kind of going down. The State University of New York and the State of New York in terms of numbers of enrollments, now this is at a different scale, but still numbers are going down. Enrollments are going down. Um, don't need that one. SUNY and SUNY state enrollments, if you look at 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, they, the numbers are going down, they're not increasing, okay? So, dropping enrollments, and you get, well, it'll, it'll come back. There's a cycle. These are enrollments in your K-12. to This is the first year, I'm sure you guys read this article, that you will have the lowest number of students in your K-12 to system. It's gonna take 12 years to snake through, but the numbers are not going to go back up for a long time, if ever. So this idea that somehow the baby boomer generation is going to come back and there'll be hundreds and thousands of students that just want to beat down your doors, it's not going to happen. That was only true for us. Um, boy, we pulled up. Somehow I got the wrong one, and I really apologize. This is I had some other really much better slides, and we're going to end the slides, and I'm just going to talk to you because technology is also part of a VUCA world. So I said I would talk to you about what is VUCA. And VUCA stands for volatile, ambiguous, um, complex, or uh, volatile, um, uh, I almost want to call it unstable. Uncertain, uncertain thank you. Because I've now convinced myself it's unstable. Um, complex and ambiguous. And the idea behind this is that Everything that we're talking about, everything that we're doing is, is sort of up for grabs. 
And so this morning, just to see if, in fact, what kind of a VUCA, VUCA world we're living in, I went to the New York Times and I went to Inside Higher Ed. And what are some of the stories that you guys saw in either one of those today? Just give me some ideas of things that alarmed you a little bit. Coronavirus. Is there going to be a pandemic? I don't know. Wash your hands and avoid your friends. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's going to solve it. Meanwhile, everybody's behind our president going, you know, it's happening. Yeah. That's very frightening because think of it this way. So I run an organization that much of what we do is go to college campuses and help them figure out how to serve adult learners better. If college campuses and any of you need to shut down for some number of months, and go to all online because the parents of your students say, I don't want my kid in a dorm room, I want them at home, and this could happen, you know this, then we all of a sudden uh, aren't making any money to keep the lights on. Sorry, but that's what's going to happen, right? You guys are going to have to figure out how to go online quickly, like massively, like scale up. I'm not trying to be alarmist, but I think we don't know. We don't know what we don't know, and that's part of what a VUCA world is, which is why you have to keep getting ready for it. What about in Inside Higher Ed? Were there some things in there today? The accreditors um, are now post-regional. The accreditors are now post-regional. So WASC just decided that they would open up their accreditation to um, other organizations, other institutions from other parts of the country, and they made some little caveat about under what conditions, but it's going there. Where, you know, I could be, I could pick and choose. I like WASC better, they're a little more innovative, so I'm gonna stay here in Arkansas, but I'm gonna get them to accredit me. That's possible now, and it's gonna, it's just gonna head that way. Um, how about one more VUCA example? It doesn't have to be in the New York Times or Inside Higher Ed. Did you hear something today that you were like, whoa, do you ever wake up and not hear those things anymore? <laughs> I mean, this stuff is, is um, you know, it's kind of alarming because we don't have answers. And there are things that we don't know what to do with. Got you got the right one. Oh, bless your heart. See, it is a VUCA world. Um, so, and I wanted to share with you, I'm normally not an afraid person, but I think this is a time when it's really important that we understand and face our fears at times. Because if not, we're gonna all just, I think, revert to some really bad behaviors um, instead of coming together and trying to figure out how we're gonna solve some of these big issues. And I do think education has, uh, there's a big part of that with education. So I was on the train coming in this morning, and normally, you know, I don't pay much attention, but I, I, I wasn't worried about other people, but I sneezed twice. And I sneeze, I see some of you shaking your head. And I'm just allergic to a lot of stuff. So I get on trains, I'm allergic to f fuzz, people, whatever. And I sneezed into my elbow once and then twice. And for the first time ever in my life, I looked around like, please don't judge me. I, I'm not sick. I was waiting for the angry mob, you know, to like throw me off the train because these terrible things are happening. And we really have to come back to some sense of sanity as we deal with this stuff. I talk to people all the time who are terrified about AI, about the future of robots, they're gonna take all of our jobs, there will be no teachers anymore. We gotta get control of ourselves and we've gotta have leadership at every level that helps us plan for the future that is coming without being overly panicked about it. But this is like a time of panic. I joked about the 25 year revolution for online education. We are now gonna probably see revolutions of like 25 months. So AI, it's here and it's coming. More of it's coming. Does that mean that human beings are obsolete? No, hardly. We're part of um, Strata Education Network. And uh, Strata Education Network, thank you for the right slides. That was my error. Um, they do a lot of research about the future of work. So there you go. And there's a happier version of it. Um, but I think it's actually true. I don't mean to be Pollyanna. In, in times like this, you have to have a clear vision. You have to seek understanding. You've got to be very clear with people, even though there's all this noise going on. And you have to be agile. 
And for people who really like planning, traditional planning, where you lay out, I'm going to be here in three years, and I'm going to need these resources, and here are the milestones, this is not that world. You have to be strategic. You have to be agile. You have to be ready to go and fit in certain lanes as they emerge before you. We've never done this before. Um, so here's the overall. The thing I really wanted to show you was that first, on the far left, all enrollments are dropping. Uh, Four-year private nonprofits, they're not so bad. They're upticking. And so are the, well, the four-year publics are about, you know, level. Why is that? Probably because a lot of the for-profits are really in the hole. And so they picked up some things. So they picked up some students. And then the two-year publics. Two-year publics, community colleges, they are hurting. Is anybody here from a community college? You're, are, are your enrollments down? Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. People are hurting. Yeah, it's across the board. It's the faculty, I mean, presidents, if you get them in a room and talk to them of community colleges, they're terrified by this. Um, New student demographics, so look at New York. Uh, you are in that unfortunate gray <laughs> box down there towards the bottom where you just are losing more and more of those traditional age students. Uh, your best solution is to just move the whole state into Montana. <laughs> and then, yeah, there you go, then you'll have enough. Uh, another view of it, there's gonna be this big drop and the drop is not changing, it's not gonna go away. Uh, here's the K through 12 enrollment. You're going to have this for a long time. So what is the dramatic shift? The dramatic shift is going from traditional to adult. I was at a conference recently, and almost every speaker stood up and said, the incumbent worker is your new student. And that's exactly right. We just need to start saying that. The incumbent worker, the person who's uh, driving the lift, who's managing your grocery store, who is fixing your th things, who is, and I'm talking about all levels, because we have to realize we're in a world where people are going to live longer and have a longer career, and so they're going to have to have credentials that they keep stacking and that they keep um, taking as they move up in their career. It's not going to be the case that, and I, and I want to make sure that Kale, which really focuses on adults, um, we cannot be about just the short-term certificate. Like, that's a good first thing. If, if you can get a first certificate and you get a great job, that's good. But if that's all we do for you as an educational system, then you're going to be stranded there. And we now see all these terrible stories coming out from Amazon. You've seen the 60-minute reports, et cetera. The conditions for the Amazon workers on the warehouse floor, even if they're making 15 or $20 an hour, are pretty deplorable. We don't want to strand people there. We want to give them more routes, more pathways out. They should be able to get a college degree by stacking a number of learning experiences. We've got to start thinking like that. Um, so here's, the, here's how we need to be thinking about life. This is the old model. You went to school, we front loaded you, gave you everything you needed, went to work, had a family. If, if you told me your age, I knew what you were probably doing at that point and then you retired and played golf. Okay, now that's like a fantasy. Nobody fit that exactly, but that was kind of the expectation. <coughs> Today, it's much more complicated. So across the top, I have a little ribbon of, look, it's gonna be your first certificate, your first job, your next certificate, your next degree. You're gonna have two kids, and then maybe you're gonna have a third one 10 years later. Maybe you're gonna raise your grandkids at some point and you're not gonna retire at 60, you're not gonna retire at 65, you're gonna, we have to help people continue their careers or get new careers. Um, I had a speaker giving this same message to my, my staff, partially because I need them to mirror what's going on out there. Many of them have been at Kale a long, long time. And I'm saying to them, like, I really like you guys, but you probably need to figure out your next job, because I can't promise the, the job you have today in Kale is the one you're going to have for the rest of your life. Like, I can't, I wish I could, I can't. And one of, the, one of my staff, I love Barry, Barry was like, that's such great news. i got to start switching jobs. I have, to, I have time to make up or I've got, you know, jobs to make up. He realized he needs to go out and, and get more experience and have more jobs. Um, so 
one more piece of data, and I'm not trying to, you know, totally bum you out, but you have to see the numbers, and this is the SUNY and the New York State. The numbers of, you know, students just signing up, their, your traditional pipeline, they are going down, they're going to keep going down. I sliced it and diced it many different ways. You've got to go back and tell your, you, everyone that you work with, you've got to get ready for that. So even though it's great to be going online, you can't take it for granted. You can't think just because you're going online, everything's going to be fine. And that's what we have to really get across uh, in this country, I think. So I was also asked to talk a little bit about who are these new adult students and you know, what are they like. And, and so this was a study done um, by the um, National Center for Student Engagement. And they compared adult students and traditional age students. And they found that adult students more, are more likely to take their classes online. We knew that, right? They usually begin their education at another institution. And so I met one of your folks here who had started at UMUC and then transferred to Empire. Um, probably the right choice, because she's a New Yorker, and you want to you wanna graduate from your home institution. Use that. They tend to enroll part-time. They are more engaged academically. And it was interesting because the adults all said, I have better connections with my faculty. I have great engagements with my fellow students. But they also reported that all the services and the teaching model was much worse than the traditional age students. So they were making the best of a not very good learning experience that they were having. See what I'm saying? So the younger students didn't know any better. And if you want to, if you want to see the difference in expectations, find a student at one of your large institutions and ask them about what goes on in the classroom. So I have a great nephew, goes to Penn State. He's like brilliant. He's in the honors program. We spent last weekend with him and he was telling us this. I didn't even ask him. He just was telling me about one of his classes and students, some of the students don't really get it. And, um, but he's glad he gets it because the faculty member never returns the quizzes or the papers. Never. And I was like, wait, never? He's like, no, we haven't gotten anything back. I have no idea. I have to keep going into the next week without knowing what I got. This is still happening, folks. That's really bad. But it's completely acceptable. Nobody is turning this faculty member in. My great nephew was like, it's just how it is. That's how it is. I knew it was going to be like this. We have to do better. Um, adults had a po these positive per perceptions of teaching practices and interactions, although they reported fewer interactions with faculty and peers and that they felt less support. They know when they're not getting what they need. Um, when I talk about adult learners, I also want to just make the point that I'm talking about what some of you might call post-traditional, some of you might call new majority. This is anyone whose identity is not first and foremost, a college student. So if you ask someone, so what do you do? If you don't say, oh, I'm a student at Penn State. Uh, I'm a student at Oswego. I'm a student at, if they say, I have a, you know, I work here, I have this family, and oh yeah, I go to school part time. That's an adult student. They could be 19, they could be 18. They could be 65. That is the majority of our students today and it will continue to be an ever-increasing majority. This is not um, a revolution. It, uh, it's been happening for a while. We just choose not to maybe notice it. And so my challenge to you is that we have to go out and not just grow online. You have to do that. But you also have to challenge and transform our educational models. So I gave you a couple of examples. University Innovation Alliance. You need to be scanning the horizon constantly for what's going on that's interesting. Has anyone heard of the University Innovation Alliance? Ten? What is it? Tell me what it is. University, it's a, it's a group of institutions who are working together to, um, it, oh, I was just having my, I don't have one, to improve um, education for kind of traditionally marginalized students. And they're they're not they're not institutions like mine. They are, you know, like um, what's sort of like what like top ten. They're research institutions. Yeah, R ones. Yeah. Absolutely. 
So these are 10 R1s that it was a miracle they could come together. Gates had to give them money. They got all kinds of grant money. But they are run, and they've been together for five years. They've done a lot of work with trying with, as you can see on their website, they, they've increased the number of degrees awarded to students that have not traditionally been well served by them. So University Innovation Alliance, take a look at what they're doing. There's really interesting work that they're doing, and it's all about systems change and ecosystems change. Uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, not a bastion of like super cool innovation, some innovation, but somewhat traditional. A friend of mine works there now though, and he is in charge of innovation, so he, uh, we talk regularly about what that takes. They're doing this immersive, and an assisted immersive classroom to be used in first credit bearing classes to speak Chinese. Immersive learning is coming, it's gonna be a thing we need to do more of it. It will help with assessment. There, there's got to be some experimentation going on around that. Um, do you guys remember Jill Watson? Remember who Jill is? Who's Jill Watson? Yeah, it's an AI teaching assistant. And the students were fooled. They did not know that it was an AI teaching assistant. I'm guaranteeing you, you all have had an interaction with a AI a robot online. You might not know it, so if they pop up a chat and there's somebody on there and they're a little stilted, it's probably AI. It's happening. Um, my point to you is always start with the learner in mind. You guys are the innovators, but you're going to have to innovate more. There's a lot going on out there. Start with the learner. Get to know your learners. Make sure you know who your learners are. Um, Design your programs and your delivery models around the learner. I know in traditional education, this is often hard to do. It's not impossible. Keep influencing. Keep talking. There are faculty who care. It's just going to be that 25-year that revolution. We just don't have 25 years. Um, create stackable credentials and ongoing education to career pathways. Prepare learners for the future and help them become agentic learners, not learners that just come to the classroom and write down a bunch of stuff and then spit it back out. We have to prepare them so that they have 60 years of learning ahead of them and they're going to have to learn how to maneuver through that pathway. So you guys are the future. You guys should be moving, you know, SUNY online and SUNY OER and SUNY whatever the next version is. Um, and it's all going to come down on us pretty quickly. So VUCA world, think strategy. You can't really plan the way we used to. You've got to be bold and do some experiments. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you and see if you have any questions. OK, who has the first question for Marie? Thank you, Marie. Sure. Anything coming in online, Erin? What's the uh, most innovative um, application of PLA you've seen lately? The most innovative application of PLA. Wow, that, you know, I could talk for three hours. I know. So, <laughs> Kale used to be all about PLA, per learning assessment. And, you know, we still are. It's, it's an important thing to do. But... It is an onerous process. It's difficult to systematize within your campuses. It's sometimes hard to get uh, adults to actually do it. Do you all know what prior learning assessment is? Is this something you know? No? Yes? OK. Um, I think it, there hasn't been a whole lot of innovative work. Because it's, it is, it's a wonderful concept. It's, you help adults really figure out what they've learned at the college level and reflect on it so they can get college credit for what they know from outside of the college classroom. But it's really difficult to do. What's really exciting is immersive learning. When, when we have some sort of AI process that we can put a student into an actual simulated situation and they can demonstrate and show what they know. We need to work towards that. Um, I'm trying to get us to think and maybe get a grant that we can work in that direction. So how about if SUNY thinks they want to do that? And then we should go after a big grant. I'm not kidding. 
Uh, it's the future, it's not what it used to be. So. Marie, given yes, your position in Cal and Strata and you know its focus on um, the future of work and social mobility, mm -hmm. um, where do you think an institution like the State University can, of New York can, can kind of hit a sweet spot? Um, well, you know, where we've, and we've got, we've got higher education in a nutshell. And you know, we've got community colleges, we've got workforce development, we've got research institutions, we've got trade schools. Um, it seems like we should be uniquely positioned mm -hmm. um, to do some very interesting things. But just curious from the position that you <coughs> sit in with Kale and also with Strata, if you can give us kind of any insights where we, we, we're making strides, but we're not connecting all the dots yet. Bingo. That's what I was going to say. That the real action and where interesting things are happening are in states and regions that are connecting the dots. So you're right. You have all of these wonderful entities. You get community colleges, trade schools, four-year research. You got workforce entities, and everybody's concerned about a couple of things. One is that there aren't enough employees. Let's just be crass, there aren't enough people to take the jobs out there. So talent pipelines are an issue. Universities are worried about enrollment. Um, and here's the poor person sitting in New York who needs a pathway uh, for a lifetime. And they don't really know how to access that pathway or even if it exists until they stumble across someone who can help them with it. So what Strata is really trying to think through, and they're talking a lot about the ecosystem, and it's very much what Kale is going to be aligned to as well, that you have to work across sectors. Like, if you just change higher ed, that's not enough. You've got to have partnerships with forward-thinking employers. You've got to work with workforce entities. You know, workforce boards are not just about people who are unemployed and need their next job. They're now becoming more about economic development and helping people with a lifelong, continuous learning pathway. We have to get out of sort of the four walls of our own organization and work across. So as a learner, if, if you were to go and ask probably 10 learners, what should you all do? They could probably tell you. And it's something like, tell us how to get on that path. Tell us where it's going to lead. Tell me what kinds of jobs there are. I don't even know some of the jobs that are out there. And then help me see how I can continue through life. Having all these separate and distinct entities, it's really difficult when people have all kinds of other things in their lives. Now, I know people, that's going to be hard to do. Sometimes events overtake us. And I'm honestly concerned that events will overtake us if we don't start pushing in that direction. And there are some really good examples of states that are thinking about this. Pennsylvania finally is starting to think about this in various sections, because their state system, you know, is in a lot of trouble. I mean, there are systems, there are state schools in that system that are going to go out of business, literally, if they don't do something, and they're working on that. Um, Ohio, West Virginia, in some ways, being New York, and you've had, no, you guys haven't had a surfeit of riches, but, you know, you've probably been better, uh, there's a respect for higher education here that you maybe don't have in every other state. Those states that really crashed, the economy went down and money was pulled out of their higher education system, they've had to be really thoughtful in now what they're going to come back and do. And so, you know, like, don't wait until you have to do it. Like, w do it now. Go forward and get ready for the future. Anyone else? I've stunned them, or else they need they need coffee or something. What question? Yes, yes, sir. Um, from your perspective and the experiments, um, like the in the morning, the Dr. Anderson tell us like the most online successful course will be topic oriented, and what uh, you think the successful online course for the adult learners? what are the features of this kind of course will be. Did you say topic oriented? Or? No, no, it's like um, she mentioned like the topic and the skill oriented 
online course will be more successful for the adult, for the online courses and like that. But for the online course for the adult learners, is there any difference? Yeah. Or I, well, do you think? You know, I, th I think it depends. And so, you know, we talk a lot about skills. Um, and I think one of the things we have to do is define what we mean by skill. Everybody means something slightly different. Um, I think what, for adults, at least in my experience, <laughs> They, they need a pack they need a program that they can follow easily and I don't mean the content is easy but that's designed for them and they need to be able to apply what they're learning and so if that was the point being made that it was about the skills yeah but we still need and this is so important we can't we sh we're not talking about and kale does not stand for it's just about skills we have to learn those other kinds of life skills like critical thinking and being able to work with people and being able to synthesize and evaluate um, not just the narrow skill of today. So, you know, all these folks learning coding, it's great. They're going to get a great first job. But nobody wants to code the rest of their lives, right? When they decide that they want to then move up into management or do something else, they're going to have to get more education, and it's going to have to be a broader education. So I still believe that's why I'm talking about stackable pathways. I think, in fact, you know, if I could rule the world, uh, maybe everybody starts with some kind of a certificate that gets them into a first good job, so they actually have a, a, a living wage. Unless their parents are, you know, there'll always be people who can afford to go to the, you know, the elites, but then they can move up. Uh, as they as they work in that that you know type of field, but I don't think it probably it will be about a topic. It'll be much more focused on you know I want to be this right as opposed to I'm going to go major in history. Nothing against history, but and then I'm going to go figure it out. It'll be much more of an applied kind of program. My two cents. Okay. We're just about right. at time. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm sorry about the, the slides. But, well, thank you for saving me. We had too many versions running around. No, no worries. Now let's turn you off here. Yeah. We're going to set up for our next presentation and uh, and go right away. So.